Yo, yo, hoy, pirates, life for me. Billy's plunder rifle, a little drink up me, artist, yo, ho. Kidnap and rabbits, and don't give a hoot. Ah, boy. Folks here about say, bro, rabbit's leaving home. I say he's heading for trouble. We're up to Neverland! Hey, everybody, I'm done programming our new voice activation system. Now all our household items will do anything we tell them to do. Great. Tell the refrigerator to bring me a root beer. It is time for me to tell you all about W. -W Radio. my friend and welcome to the WW radio show your Walt Disney World information station I am your host Lou Mangello and this is show number 537 and I'm here once again not only to help you have the best vacation experience when you go to the parks but I also want to bring you a little bit of that Disney magic wherever you are not just with the podcast but with my videos live broadcasts on Facebook every Wednesday night books audio tours special events and more you can find everything over at www.radio.com. So November is Native American Heritage Month, and this week we're going to look at references to Native Americans in Walt Disney World, including their earliest beginnings in Disneyland. We'll explore the history of the references, tribes, artwork, and culture, as well as trace back and discuss their presence in Disney feature films and connection to Walt Disney himself. We'll look back at not only some extinct references in the parks, but also discuss some unrealized concepts, attractions, and lands. We'll also explore everywhere you can currently find Native American inspiration, art, and stories in Walt Disney World, including the new Creating Tradition, Innovation, and Change in American Indian Art in the American Adventure Pavilion in Epcot. I'll then have the answer to our last Walt Disney World trivia question of the week, and I'll pose a new challenge for your chance to win a Disney prize package. Then stay tuned to the end of the show as I'll have more information about November and December's Meet of the Month, a special offer for not one, but two events coming up next year, your voicemails and more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. In 1990, President George H.W. Bush approved a joint resolution designating November as National Native American Heritage Month. And the Library of Congress, the National Archives and Records Administration, the National Endowment for the Humanities, National Gallery of Arts, National Park Service, the Smithsonian, and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum all join in in paying tribute to the rich ancestry and traditions of Native Americans. And this month, I thought we would do the same by looking at the many references, tributes, contributions, influences, and stories of Native Americans in the Disney parks, as well as other Native American connections to Disney in film, animation, and maybe even in Walt's personal life. And joining me to discuss these references, and ones that I hope you will seek out, explore, and learn more about, not just on the show, but when you go to the parks, is a man who knows not just about the Disney connections, but has discussed and shared his own heritage and love of Native American history and culture through his incredibly popular website, powwows.com, videos, events, podcasts. He's also my longtime friend, Mr. Paul Gowder. Welcome to the show, buddy. Thanks, Lou. I appreciate you having me. It is, uh, it is to good it. to have you here. And so first things first, you know, we're talking about Native American, not just in the parks, but as I was sort of thinking about this, I'm like, well, if we talk about the parks, we've got to talk about, you know, a little bit in film and then make a there's a connection to Walt. But you yourself are Native American. You're, you're part Native American, correct? Yes, I'm part Native on my dad's side. Um, his family was from uh, northern part of Georgia, the Cherokee up in that area. Um, and some of them moved out to Oklahoma, some stayed. So that's where, yes, it comes from my, my father's side. And, and you know, I've, I've learned a lot about Native American history and stories and event. I, I didn't realize there's actually hundreds of Native American tribes in North America, correct? 
Yes, uh, there's over 500 recognized tribes. Um, and then, of course, there's lots of other smaller tribes that uh, states recognize that the federal government doesn't. So, yeah, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of tribes. And it's interesting because we've known each other for a long time and your site, powwows.com, you've been sharing so much about the history and stories and, and art, not just for Native Americans, but people like me who want to and, and honestly have learned a lot on your site. When did you start powwows? Because you're like an old timer, man. And, and, <laughs> and, and why did you do it? It was a complete accident. It's a uh, funny story. So 19, it was around 1996. It was a little bit before that, but uh, I was in graduate school at the time and uh, a couple of friends of mine, we were, you know, just dabbling in the internet. I can remember staying up late waiting for a, a weather map, to, you know, to download for 30 <laughs> minutes to see that it was going to rain in 20 minutes, you know? Um, and so we, we started teaching ourselves how to do web pages. And of course I needed something to build it about. So the two things I was into at the time, I, I was a powwow dancer, you know, participated in powwows. And um, so I built a page about that and about the outfit that I had made and the beadwork, those kind of things. And I also built a, a page about Star Wars collecting. That page is still in, <laughs> in its same state that it was in 1996. It's still out there. Um, but powwows, people's, people related to it. Um, there was nothing out there like that. And uh, people started coming and asking questions and it just grew from there. You know, we opened up a, uh, a community on a forum and we started getting lots of conversations and engagement and it's just grown over time. So now, it, it, like you said, it's a place where um, natives come, but also if anybody just interested in the native culture, we try to share that through our articles or photos or videos. Um, we stream powwows live, you know, you can, and you can even find some events that you can go to in person through our website. So we're hoping we're just a gateway for people to enjoy the, the rich history and culture. It's a, uh, and I mean this in an affectionate way, powwows is, is very much a, um, uh, a deep rabbit hole because I've gone there sometimes to look for something. And next thing I know I'm going from one article because I remember as a kid and I remember, I think I told you this maybe the first time I, I, I met you or talked to you as a kid. I think it was 1985. My family, my brother, my parents and I drove across country, we drove from New Jersey across the top of the United States, came down went across the, the the bottom border down to Florida, obviously to Disney World, and then back up. And I still, my parents still have, my mom still has, um, I'll never forget meeting a Native American artist in North Dakota. And I remember his name was Pahaska, and he made this beautiful piece of original art on, on a skin, and it was something that for some reason impacted me. So coming to your site and learning more about it sort of brought back a sense of nostalgia. But you're not only Native American and run this incredibly popular site, uh, but you're also a huge Disney fan. And as we yes. started talking, and this being Native American Heritage Month, I thought I would have you come on to combine your two passions to discuss Native Americans not just in the parks, but I think before we even get to the parks, we have to talk a little bit about the films. And I think we even need to start earlier on. And I think we have to start with Walt himself. And I love the fact that there is a direct personal connection to Native American history and heritage to Walt. And again, I think, you know, Walt was a person who had a great deal of respect for all cultures, but his wife Lillian Bounds at the time was actually born on an Indian reservation in Spalding, Ohio, back in 1899 as the 10th and final child <laughs> of Jeanette Shortbounds and Willard Bounds. And her father worked for the government. Um, he was a blacksmith and a federal marshal. And I've read that she would tell Walt stories of literally like coming to the West, like in a covered wagon and the history of Native Americans that she had met, uh, my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that, that Idaho, um, where she's from, was home of the Blackfoot tribe, which is something we'll actually yes. touch on a little mm -hmm. bit later on. But she, and I think the stories that she told Walt and her personal perspective probably had some influence or at least some input on the Davy Crockett series that, you know, where, where Davy defended some of the different tribes. Yeah, you got to believe that uh, they had those kind of conversations and Walt loved to travel too. So I'm sure that he, like you, he had some experiences with uh, Native American tourism or, or going around and seeing some of this. So yeah, you got to believe that uh, she had an influence on him and, and they talked a lot about that culture. Um, you can, 
you can definitely see it coming through Walt's uh, Walt, but yeah, like you said, we'll get to it later, but the, there's so much in the parks. It's so, um, so incredibly integrated into some of the things in the park. Yeah. And even back in 96, um, Lillian donated a hundred thousand dollars and forgive me as I'm going to, this is probably gonna be the first of many names that I butcher the Nez purse. Nez purse, yes. Nez purse, who were who were trying to buy some ancient tribal artifacts, and she donated a hundred thousand dollars to the tribe in order to um, let them do that. But I think that was look, you know, Walt being the the ultimate storyteller. When we think about Walt telling stories about Native Americans, there's probably ones that come to mind. But Walt actually, the first film that he had in mind to represent Native Americans was one that he was looking to do right after World War II, which was the story of Hiawatha um, based on the, the poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He wanted to create a full length feature film and a lot, he had his artists actually go out and research a lot of the tribes of the Northern Great Plains. There was discussion about how characters were going to deliver some of the narration in authentic native sign language and how Walt had actually looked into um, having Native Americans working on and helping with some of the concept art. And I know Dick, Dick Kelsey was one of the chief Disney artists, spent you know a month, two months going to the Great Lakes, looking at some of and documenting some of the settings of Longfellow's poem. But unfortunately, um, and this had, had research had gone on for a, a while, but about 1950, 1951, this idea was shelved really because Walt didn't know how to tell that story appropriately and make it something that an early 1950s audience would be interested in. You know, and it's interesting to, to hear those kind of stories um, in in contrast to some of the natives that we do see in early Disney films. And we'll talk about it in a minute. What The obvious one is Peter Pan and, and the character caricatures of natives in that film as opposed to uh, doing something authentic and like you said, it, it was 1950s um there were lots of characters of um, people of color and different cultures going on at the time um i, I don't know that in a 50s audience would have responded to a hiawatha film um maybe you know nothing ever dies in disney so maybe that <laughs> maybe that idea will come back around and to that point and and i i want to preface this part of the conversation by being very, very clear. Please don't, if, if, if I speak or misspeak, I do not excuse or condone necessarily anything that was portrayed in films. Uh, many films that were made in that era were, and obviously still are, appropriate. Um, many still wouldn't be made today. And I don't even, I don't even just mean like Disney films, like there's scenes in Breakfast at Tiffany's that could not get made and Song of the South. I love Airplane and Blazing Saddles. We would never see these movies today, but it was a different time. And I think when we start thinking back to, you know, some of the some of the even very early, even before we get to Peter Pan, some of the very early um, shorts and films look obviously things like like Song of the South come to mind. But I think when we think of Native Americans, we our minds probably go right to 1953's Peter Pan um, when it's not just the visual portrayal, but there's songs like What Makes the Red Man Red. Again, not not excusing or legitimizing or condoning, but, you know, going back to the the original writings of, of J.M. Barry and how there were these these cast of the, uh, this cast of characters was portrayed from Princess Tiger Lily to the Native American tribe. And to your point, this was something that was happening a lot. And it, it's not saying it was right, but, you know, some of the characters in Dumbo and the Siamese Cats and Lady and the Tramp and King Louie in the Jungle Book, you know, J.M. Barry's original portrayal of the Native Americans were not meant to necessarily be grown-up fiction. I sort of almost thought about it as it was these these characters as seen through a child's eyes, right? And and obviously some of the vernacular, like the Piccaninny tribe and and Redskins and, you know, Tiger Lily called Peter the, the Great White Father um, was 
right, wrong, or otherwise, it was the vernacular that was used, obviously, um, today would not necessarily be appropriate, certainly. Right. There's no way they would make that film today. Um, I do find it interesting as, as somebody involved in Native culture that um, things like Song of the South get uh, shelved for their caricatures, but other cultures, we, we still kind of put them out there. Right or wrong, it's it's just interesting to see how that happens. Um, and you're right, you know, it was the time. It, that's how it. Lots of things were being done at the time. I'm, for me though, I like the fact that um, Walt and those and those early producers back then were were thinking about natives and they were including them in their stories. Um, what I always encourage people to do though is when you see these these old ones, you know, just remember that the native culture is still alive take that as just use it as a starting point to go find out more about them. And I hope when, when people see tiger lily, you know, it'll maybe raise a question and say, mate, what is a native American? Let me go look into that. And hopefully it'll spark a conversation and uh, we can get away from believing that's just how they are all the time. Yeah. Right. And every time there's a conversation about a Disney princess, you know, we're like, well, is tiger, you know, is tiger lily um, a, a Disney princess. But again, the, the terminology that was used was taken Obviously, not the song itself, but but a lot of the terminology and and um, look e- even you know uh, the representations of the chief and you know just asking how and things like that. But I think even years later, Mark Davis, who was one of the supervising animators, was like, you know, I'm not sure that if we had to do it again, this is exactly the way we would do it. Um, this is the way it was done back then. So even in in a short amount of time thereafter um they realized that while animation at that time was was oftentimes based on exaggeration right whether it's you know the representation of a people or getting hit with you know well wily e. coyote you know falling a thousand feet and getting hit in the face with an anvil he was able to bounce right back from that um disney i think over time um started to and and look disney was not the only studio that was doing this um and in time some of the other studios would start to retroactively try and correct some of those things and disney did it as well from something as simple as taking a cigarette out of out of pecos bill's hand to um uh, cutting out the the minotaur scene from um fantasia fantasia not releasing song of the south to while there's many, many wonderful redeeming quality about the characters and the story and the message of Song of the South, I don't think that that will ever get re-released um, in in its original form. Uh, I think in time, as as we became more more appropriately sensitive, um, in Hook in 1991, Steven Spielberg cut out Tiger Lily altogether. Um, uh, the 2003 film Peter Pan starred an actor of and again forgive me for my mispronunciation Haida H I A D A and then mm-hmm. there was also yes. a, a mini series called Neverland in 2011 I'm going to totally butcher this name Korlanka Kitcher who had a a Quechua father Q U E C H U A as Tiger Lily so the person who played Tiger Lily had a had a native american um parent so um you know peter pan while while a a beautiful film i think maybe to your point paul in terms of if you start to sort of go down the appropriate rabbit rabbit hole in terms of the representation of native americans while the way maybe um um John was referencing the footprint like, oh, it's the Blackfoot tribe and the Al- Algonquin group. Maybe that will for somebody go, oh, you know, I've heard my uncle say he was a member of the Algonquin tribe or, you know, maybe there's a way that people can take that um, that reference and turn it into a positive learning experience. And, that, you know, I hope that happens. Um, but, you know, like you said, at the time, the Westerns that were being made were so stereotypical, you know, the Hollywood how Indian. Um, the, the stoic ending that stands there, it was definitely what they did at the time. Um, but we, I see it on my site all the time. People come and they'll, they do, it is a, um, a starter that they come and start asking questions. Um, so 
you know, let's hope that, uh, that it's a conversation starter and not, um, you know, uh, the perception that they're stuck in that time frame. Um, you know, and to be clear, yeah. I, I, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, if you think about the time, and I think, I think Walt's actions immediately thereafter make, again, I'm not Native American, so, but it made me feel better about the representation because I, I don't think it was meant to be a deliberate poking fun as we have seen elsewhere. There, there's other very popular full length, you know, Academy Award nominating winning films where the portrayal of Native Americans, Asians is very offensive and stereotypical. And, you know, like I mentioned, Breakfast at Tiffany's, you know, without going into the details, the the portrayal of certain characters was not made by, uh, you know, the portrayal of an Asian character was not portrayed by an agent. It was almost more of a, a, a poking fun type of way. But when you get to something like Davy Crockett a couple of years later, Walt looks at this opportunity, I think, very differently than other film producers at the time. Because even though Davy is sort of identified as, as an Indian fighter, to, to use the, the, the actual terminology, a lot of the time in the films, he's working with and he's helping and the uh, uh, and defending the Native Americans um, in the film itself, two hundred Native Americans were actual Cherokees, as opposed to casting, you know, Italian Americans, Hispanic Americans as Native Americans. So in those King of the Wild Frontier and and Davy Crockett goes to Congress, and yes, even the Davy Crockett Indian Fighter the representation and the portrayal of, of Native Americans and the casting of American, Native Americans, I think, is vastly different than a lot of what was going on in Hollywood, not just in the early 50s, but for a long time thereafter. It, it, like you said earlier, uh, Walt is a storyteller, and I think the power of Disney is telling authentic stories, and Walt looked and found an authentic way to tell that story. Disney doesn't always get it right, but uh, as I think we'll as we'll see, we start talking about the parks. Disney is trying, and they are um, they try to tell the authentic story. And I think that is what resonates with people when you bring in the native actors and you bring in the actual culture. Um, it does make for a much richer, richer story, right? And, and certainly, as we get to more modern times, there's obviously 1995's uh, Pocahontas and, and the telling of the story of um, Pocahontas, uh, who I found out was not actually her real name. Her real name was. Amunut, Am, Amunut, and then the, the, she earned the nickname Pocahontas, which means playful one because of uh, her personality and whatnot. So, transitioning from there, and I and sort of sort of going back to Davy Crockett, which I think Paul lends it, its good transition not to Walt Disney World, but go. Let's go back to Disneyland first because when it opened in 1955, I think part of the reason why it had. Some of the lands that it did was it was an opportunity for Walt to tell those stories, to your point, not in a two-dimensional, you know, a passive experience, static film, but an interactive. So when Disneyland opened in July, it had a, 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 an Indian village, which represented a number of different Native American tribes, where more importantly, Paul, guests could not only watch and listen but they could learn and they could interact and get a better understanding of the culture. There was a ceremonial dance circle. There were um, the Indian war canoes. There was a lot of um, ways for people to see how the Navajo and the Comanche and the Apache and, and some of the different, um, which, which were endorsed by the, the tribal councils and the, the U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs, I think was a, a wonderful opportunity for guests not just to learn, but to the point we were making before about some of the studios and their films to get a better understanding of who and what Native Americans really were. Yeah, I so wish I could have been there for that. That, that to me, just sounds like an incredible experience. Um, and, you know, you go into a theme park and you're thinking roller coaster or something and you walk up upon that. I, I just try to put myself in, in a, you know, being a kid in 1955 and thinking about that would have been in a just – crazy experience um i so wish we could do that now of course you know the ride capacity <laughs> or the the throughput of something like that you just can't do it um but yeah that's it's so awesome to hear those kind of stories and and think about what the kids back then 
you, you got to know that they all went home and look, looked at their history books or whatever and, and found more stories about natives. That's really cool. Well, I think, too, about the time. You know, it's the 1950s. What are kids watching on TV? It's all these Westerns and Look, what did kids play? You know, they don't do this now, but, you know, even as a kid grew up in, up in the 70s, you played Cowboys and Indians. So right. they would watch that on TV or in, in from, on the opposite side, they would experience things like the Indian Village, which actually moved and expanded in 1956 and, and where it stayed until 1971. If you look at some of those early maps, there was so many different, there was the Indian War Canoes, the Indian Village. There were all these opportunities for guests to not just walk through, but learn with, you know, um, um, visuals. And I think more importantly, like I said, the, the, um, the interactive element there. And, and even to this day, there's still, if you, if you go back and look at, at some of the early maps, the, the Davy Crockett Explorer canoes were there. That was that connection to some of the Disney TV shows Um, that opened um, originally as the Indian War Canoes in July, uh, on July 4th of all days, uh, 1956 as part of the expansion. And first of all, I love that attraction just in its simplicity. It's a lot of work. It's tough in the summer, but but it's <laughs> yeah, also yeah. Uh, a lot of fun. And it's one that exists uh, or existed in all the parks. So in Walt Disney World, so sort of, so to make our way over to Disney World, the Davy Crockett Explorer Canoes was an opening day sea ticket attraction where there were these 35 foot canoes where you would, um, there was a, a dock sort of just north of Tom Sawyer Island, and you would travel the Rivers of America on the same path that um, the, the Liberty Bell, the Liberty Square Riverboat would travel. Um, these lasted until 1994, but there was or are ones in Tokyo that was the Davy Crockett Explorer Canoes. On the rivers of America in Western land, um, that was renamed the Beaver Brothers Explorer Canoes. Say that three times fast. <laughs> in 1992, when Critter Country opened um, in Euro Disneyland, it opened in April of 1992. That closed in 1994. Didn't last very long there. And in Shanghai, they have the Bilge Rat, the Bilge Rat Bills Explorer Canoes. Very, very tough to say, um, which is a little bit different. It goes through Treasure Cove and and Dead Man's Landing and things like that. But uh, again, that was like the stories in Fantasyland telling the stories that, that guests were seeing on TV with Davy Crockett, not attacking and fighting Native, Native Americans, but working with and helping was, I think, a wonderful transition for people to change their perceptions that maybe they had from seeing what was on TV or in movies to actually being able to experience something that they probably weren't as easily exposed to in real life as they were other than having that opportunity in Disneyland. Yeah, it's really cool. They did that. Um, you know, I just saw one of those canoes go up for auction lately and those things are huge. Like you said, 35 feet, that would have been so much fun to do. Um, so yeah, it's cool to think about, you know, and the kids going home with their cow, their, coonskin hat and their you know their bow and arrow um and playing cowboys and indians yeah it was a uh, disney was very forward thinking and having some something like that um in the educational part of it yeah and we'll really talk as we on. start to, yeah yeah as, and as we get to disney world um and and some of the attractions and experiences that were here um we'll talk even too about some of the merchandise that was available that mom, not that you listen to the show, but I hope that in one of your many storage facilities in New Jersey, you still have this one thing that I'm thinking that we bought um, back in Frontierland in the, in the early seventies, but let's, let's transition over from the movies, um, from TV, from Disneyland over specifically to Walt Disney world, because I didn't realize until we started talking just how many um, native American references there are in the parks. Um, you are my guest. You are my friend. You are the Native American expert. So I want to ask you, what was sort of that first thing on your list or what was the thing that or, or the, the most predominant portrayal or, or reference to Native American do you think in the Disney parks, in Disney World specifically? Right. For me, um, the thing that I, I always think about when I'm thinking Native culture, Disney World uh, is our favorite place to go and stay, and that's Wilderness Lodge. 
I can remember um, the first time we went into Wilderness Lodge and you see that amazing lobby um, and all the wood there. And then, um, you know, as I'm trying to take that in and then I look over and see under glass case, a, a piece of, 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 of native um, outfit, um, their, their moccasins, there's headdresses, there's all kinds of things. They're, they're replicas, of course, but um, they are very authentically made, um, very detailed. And so I've, I have spent hours walking around the Wilderness Lodge lobby, finding all of those things. Um, they're behind the check-in desk. They, they're they everywhere. Um, yeah, I've, I've taken tons of pictures and trying to get them all. That, But that is definitely what I think of when I think of Native culture. There, That's the first thing. I, I always want to go there and see those. And it's funny because I think for guests who maybe book Wilderness Lodge but haven't stayed there yet, they may not understand or realize just how much of not only is it is it a, a reference to Native American history and culture, but I think how much of, of this resort is a tribute to Native Americans with all of those displays, with some of the things that sometimes, Paul, in the lobby, even before you get to the lobby, are hiding in plain sight you know you walk through and you 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 step into this grand cavernous lobby and you're just sort of amazed at, at the woodwork and the stonework and then you you start to pick out some of the the elements because i think when we think about the the lodge itself and and i don't remember the episode where, where we talked about sort of the the history and the design of the lodge it's meant to represent the northwestern united states not anything specifically landscape wise or geography wise but even as you start to approach um, when you go through the main gate you'll find stacks of logs that have and forgive me if I don't know if there's an appropriate name for it there's sort of that that stretched animal skin art painted with Native American designs you walk into the lobby and it very much is is a, a love letter um, to Native American, um, history and culture and to your point even as you walk in and if I always tell people to look up look down if you look down you'll see that the floor is actually meant to represent a Native American Hopi rug that tells a story of a storm the center is the earth and then these four rivers flow in sort of a lightning pattern to the four corners of the earth where the lodge poles extend upwards to hold up the canopy that that is the sky so if you go up to some of the upper levels and look down you can really get a good view and paul if you don't have that photo now you've got to come back on a research trip to do it you'll look in the carpets there's the 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 symbols of unity represent among the four seasons and man and you know uh, um, uh, animal life and there's this real there's this beautiful natural marriage of the design and the co- decor that that brings in, in a very beautiful, subtle way, a lot of Native American um, style and design. And every November, so sometime during this month, there is a Native group that comes into the lodge um, in that, what you're talking about, in that uh, little uh, medicine wheel area there, um, and does a blessing and does some ceremonial singing and some dancing. Um so it, there's some YouTube videos out there if anybody wants to see that. So they actually bring in, you know, uh, some actual natives to, to take part in that. Um, but yeah, you can see lots of lots of small artwork and like you were talking about the buckskin. And there's also the totem pole there that uh, is amazing, um, goes all the way up. Um, and it's just, there's I, I do. I get lost in the details. I think the first time I ever visited, I didn't even see the totem pole until, right. <laughs> until like the second, <laughs> second or third day. I, you know, I'm pulling my wife along. Look at this. Look at this. Right. Um, and I don't mean the Humphrey the yeah. Bear totem pole outside the mercantile shop. I mean the actual totems, the 50 foot yes. high. Hand, like, and those are not. And again, look, for Disney, it's about, like you said, authenticity and the details. These 55 foot tall totem poles that 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 face each other are hand carved and they tell a very very specific story of the and it is it Haida H A I D A the Haida Indians and there is the um oh god there's the there's the raven and the the raven and the bear I'm I'm, just, I'm forgetting right yeah, now Yeah yeah there's a story behind it yes. behind the two of those um 
And I remember the first time that I walked through the the lodge going back to not long after it first opened and, and saw some of the 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 lobby displays um that there's that this beautiful elk tooth dress there's the the moccasins made by the plain indians there's a lot of different uh beadwork in some of the different cases and and i love that you can learn a little bit more uh in terms of what a, a seed bead is and and the stories behind that some of the the headdresses are spectacular um and, and they're what I love, Paul, is that they are authentic. They are not sort of, they are not made in, in central shops by Disney. These are authentic um, pieces of art or pieces of Native American history that are brought in. Again, going back to it being a learning opportunity for guests and, and certainly for kids too. Yeah. And they took a lot of time. I, I've, t- I've talked to some of my friends um, and the artists they had make these and they spent a lot of time making sure that it was very authentic down to weathering them and, um, you know, adding that old look to them. Um, you know, there's a dog soldier bonnet, there's uh ceremonial moccasins and, and everyday moccasins. Yeah. It's just amazing. The amount of time and effort that Disney went into to put those kind of things in there, those little touches um, definitely encourage anybody who hasn't done that to go and look through all the cases Um and they're all over the lobby. There, there's a, uh, like you said, they're hiding in plain sight. But some of them you do have to go and seek out. They, uh, they got them around all kinds of corners. Yeah, and I, and I, and I, when you do, um, you know, take a look at some of those headdresses, and it's interesting. I, I was reading a story about how they were created because um, the the Native Americans would normally decorate these um, headdresses with eagle feathers. Uh, because it was a very revered and respected bird, but now it's obviously illegal to use eagle feathers. So uh, when they were being created, they adapted turkey feathers to right. to recreate some of the um, the different headdresses. But but you're right, and even if you go to the front desk, um, I, I'm pretty sure it's there. You'll see that there are these reproductions of of um, cradle boards, these sort of wood yes. frames and skin pouches um, used like um, like a, a papoose and there are different cradle boards to represent different tribes. The, and, and I won't go through all of them, but names will recognize the Apache, the Comanche, the Navajo, um, the Cheyenne, the Crow tribes. So you're not just getting, like you said, there's 500 plus different tribes. You're getting a, a spectrum of, of what their, their traditions, their history, their art is like just by wandering through the lobby, which I think I think Paul, a lot of guests don't realize, is a, is a is a miniature museum and art exhibit. It is, and like the the thought behind taking and showing guests, hey, here's a cradle board, here's something that the natives used and how they used it, and guess what? All of these tribes had a slightly different way of doing it, and they all lived a slightly different life, and you can see that in their artwork and in their in the designs of their outfits and, and the tools they use. Um, it, it, the Wilder's Lodge does such a great job of telling those kind of stories. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, that definitely the thing, first thing I always think of. It's crazy. I love that place. And, and, you know, we talk about these overlooked experiences in Walt Disney World. I've never seen the blessing of the four directions. Um, I know some people who had seen them years and years ago and um, they had um, as part of, Native American Heritage Month, they would have recurring visiting interpreters. So James Hansen, whose name was Black Wolf, and Anita Hansen, whose name was Quicksilver, not the Marvel character, I don't think, they would have that ceremony and it was not something that was just, there was meaning behind it, right? It's meant to drive out the negative energy and sort of purify the resort for the year ahead. Um, I don't know if that still goes on. I'm actually going to call Wilderness Lodge or maybe go there this over the next couple of days to find out because it's something I would like to see. And if they do do it, um, certainly try and tape and share because, again, I think that's one of those um, unadvertised, overlooked opportunities that guests, especially if you take your kids, um, that's probably something that they would never get to see anywhere else or otherwise. And there's so many of those at Disney. Um, I wish they would do a better job of promoting those. Um, 
And then the other thing I love about the Wilderness Lodge lobby, though, is even at Christmas when they add all of the trees, um, there's little there's little teepees on the trees. There's uh, little can, uh, canoes um, and done in the, you know, the Indian style, kind of a dugout canoe and little totems all over the trees. So they continue the touches year round. It's nice. Yeah. And, and to your point, you know, look at the backs of the chairs, look at the chandeliers. There are so many references to native American art and culture. It, it's, it's, stunning and the detail is really something that that you need to take your time to go in or pre- and look that's why i think these these resorts and this this one especially is is an attraction in and of itself if you're looking for something to do without a park ticket one day or a different experience um go and visit one of, and and like i said it's it's beautiful around the holidays with with the giant tree in the center of the lobby as well um so when you think of disney and or walt disney world specifically and, and Native American references or tributes, where does your, your mind go next? Hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and again, we're talking about caricatures, but one of the things I always look forward to seeing every time I'm there, no matter what, is when I ride Small World <laughs> in the last room, there is a, a Native American character um, and it's not completely historical accurate, but it's, uh, you know, you go through the whole thing and, it, and I'm look, looking throughout the whole ride. I'm like, you know, they're missing us. Um, and then there in the last room, you get a little reference. So that's another one I always look for. And I'll say, you know, in Disneyland, they actually have two dolls for natives and they are dressed in more of a Navajo um, or Southwestern or South, yeah, Southwestern Plains <clears throat> outfit. And, pretty authentic there at Disneyland. They did a much better job than Disney World. Um, but yeah, those are definitely two things I always love seeing when I'm on Small World. Yeah, you know, we 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 go through Small World and, and have to sort of remember that the only representation really of North America are the the little cowboy and the Native American boy in the, the finale room. Like you said, Disneyland's is different. Uh, I have not been to Disneyland Paris. I my understanding is that the continent of North America does have its own representation there. Uh, but I don't like to watch videos. I want to see it with my own eyes before I I go through and do it. Um, you know, for me, Paul, it, when I think of of Native American representation in in Walt Disney World and, and how to connect to it. It doesn't go to, and and we'll we'll touch on this too, but it doesn't go. Oh, where can I go and meet Pocahontas? You know that that's not where right. it goes for me. Um, of all places, for me, I go to the Liberty Square Riverboat. Um, and 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 I'm going to connect that, and I'll sort of as a as a a codicil to that, we'll, we'll sort of include the Walt Disney World Railroad there because it does sort of um, pass by the uh, a similar scene, but. I love, for oh so many reasons, the simplicity, the story, the sounds, the 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 feel of the riverboat and the story that it tells and how, as it takes you around Tom Sawyer Island and through those scenes, it does go by a Powhatan Indian settlement, which is sort of a, obviously a, a reference to, um, to Pocahontas. But it, it's interesting how, and again, correct me here if, if I'm wrong, because the, the Powhatan Indian settlement references the, the film Pocahontas. But from what I understand, the Powhatan tribe was primarily located around Virginia and not necessarily as far down the, the Mississippi. And I think Captain Bixby even explains that they probably just followed the abundance of wildlife found in this vicinity. <laughs> and that's why they would be in this in this riverboat journey down the Mississippi River. Right. You know, I don't, the Palatins definitely weren't, were not on the long, the Mississippi um, <laughs> as a, as a tribe, but you know, it is a, a great way to tell a story that when you get on that river boat um, and you make the, you know, the turn and, and you're not seeing anything, you know, you don't see the castle anymore. All you're seeing is um, the, the woods and everything you are transformed or transported back in time to where that village kind of would have been um, right there on the banks of a river. Maybe not the Powhatan Indians, but um, maybe the Creeks or the Seminole or somebody else. But yeah, you know, it, it, 
it they're putting you in that story, which is is really cool to be on that riverboat and, and kind of have that experience. And to the point we were making before about correcting earlier mistakes, earlier insensitivities, however you want to, when you go on the riverboat, still to this day, you'll find an abandoned cabin off to the the, the starboard side if you're obviously facing forward. Um, way back when, when I was a kid, um, the cabin was on fire. <laughs> like the cabin was literally on fire. Yes. And there was a settler um, who was just sleeping, obviously, although he did have an arrow stuck in his chest. And the narration said that he was the victim of an unfriendly Indian attack. That was later changed to um, river pirates that set the cabin on fire. Um, then they changed it that he passed out from a little bit too much of the uh, of the moonshine, <laughs> and the exploding still is what caught uh, caused the fire. And then back, I think about two thousand five or so, the um, like on the on the Jungle Cruise, the sleeping settler, like the sleeping zebra, um, was taken out, and the fire was was killed as as a whole. And, and, you know, I don't know that th th those are one of those stories that should we even change? I mean, that that did take place. There there was conflict between the settlers and Indian tribes. Um, the Indians may tell it a little bit differently. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think um, that's why I mean, I think that's why yeah. it was there in the first place was to tell. Look, uh, you know, history, American or otherwise, is not all sunshine and rainbows there's bad stuff that happened and and that was done by a lot of different people and and you know history is what it is and i think that's what the intent was paul was to tell right look right. this is is what happened and 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 there, there were you know battles and struggles and and people lost their lives and then maybe it was okay this is not the story we need to tell uh, on this attraction at this time Right. It, it's maybe not the right place for it. It's one of those things, though, I, it, I don't think we should gloss over some of those stories. Um, maybe not the right place to tell a story of, of war and dying. Um, <laughs> but you know, every do Disney movie does start with death. So right. <laughs> if a parent doesn't die, it's probably not going to be a popular film. So. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Lion King still gets me every single time. But, you know, I think maybe this is the good uh, transition point or, or connection point to Pocahontas in the parks, right? Because although, you know, maybe they don't fit into that area of the the of the Mississippi, the Powhatan tribes were Algonquin people who inhabited the lands of Virginia. They resisted the English uh, colonist invasion of their homeland. And one of the most famous people of the tribe was Chief Powhatan. His daughter, by the way, happens to be a, a nice young lady by the name of Pocahontas, who throughout the years has had a variety of different presences um, throughout the parks. There have obviously been meet and greets. I think Pocahontas, I go back to Pocahontas and her forest friends that opened at Disney's Animal Kingdom in 1998, um, ran for about 10 years until 2008. And it was a beautiful um, story with Pocahontas and Grandmother Willow and a little tree named Sprig. And there was what I loved is that there was not just um, live performers and the magical grandmother willow tree, <laughs> but there were live animals in there who, again, not just the lesson of the Disney parks, but specifically a place like, like Disney's animal kingdom. It was about coexisting with nature and with the animals in, in harmony. Yeah. I remember that show. That was a really great show. I was sorry to see that go. Um, you know, Pocahontas is uh, is not one of Disney's shining moments as far as Native Americans. Um, the the movie does kind of uh, gloss over it, the historical accuracy of what actually happened. But again, it's um, you know I give Disney a lot of credit. They hired an actual Native to play Pocahontas, um, Irene Bedard, and you know that alone is a, a big achievement for for Native culture. Um, and I think it's really awesome that, <clears throat> excuse me, she's um, she is in the parks and you can seek her out. Um, movie aside, I, I still think it's important for to have that character there. Um, she is a very important part of Native history. Um, 
And the fact that Disney has her every day out for kids to meet and to have that interaction, you know, again, it's sparking some kind of thought and conversation that they'll go back and they'll look that up. Um, and, and it'll, it'll, trigger something else later on. So yeah, I love that Pocahontas is there. Um, and I think you're right. I, I, you know, errors, omissions, mistakes, whatever aside, I think especially not just having the film, but having her continue to have a, a, an important presence in the parks through meet and greets and in, in uh, parades and, and shows and things like that is important because I think, especially for young kids, that's going to be their first touch point. And, and to, to what you said about the film, you know, when they did produce it, I think as 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 they, you know, endeavor to do all the time, they want to make sure it's accurate and not their interpretation of accurate. So in addition to the person that you mentioned, they also hired Shirley Little Dove Kustalau McGowan, who was a Powhatan who may, I, maybe still goes through Virginia teaching the history and the culture of her people. She was a consultant. They also brought in uh, Jim Great Elk Waters, who is a Native American tribal leader and an artist and a poet. And he was brought in to provide authentic Algonquin speech and music and choreography and storytellers were all brought in. So at least they wanted to try and ensure that the the Powhatan culture and lifestyle was portrayed with as high a degree of, of accuracy as possible, as opposed to, ah, oh, we'll read it, we got this. They, they brought in people who not just know it, but, but you know, were, are members of that tribe to make sure it was culturally accurate. And one of the things I think is, is really uh, exciting for Native culture is, you know, if you look at all the Disney Princess movies, none of them are an actual historical, you know, story, whereas Pocahontas is a factual, act, you know, that actually happened. Um, and it's something so that, you know, when that little girl looks at a Disney princess and thinks, hey, you know, I want to go meet Pocahontas, she can go back and actually read up and see a real story, um, you know, and, and learn actual real history. I think that that's an awesome connection for the Native culture in Disney films. I agree. And they did. And Pocahontas has had a number of different meet and greet area. So in Liberty Square, that that beautiful, quiet little area behind ye old Christmas shop, um, the fact that there's a smoking section there now, notwithstanding, <laughs> yeah. um, has over the years been a location for a variety of different meet and greet locations. About, in, I think right around the, the time of the movie, that area became, and maybe for the first time, it was uh, uh, repurposed to specifically become a meet and greet for Pocahontas, and they named it the Enchanted Glen. And then over years, Princess Tiana came in and, and other characters as well. Um, she did go over to Camp Mini Mickey for a while, uh, as well as Rafiki's Planet Watch. So she's mm -hmm. had sort of multiple locations. And now I believe um, you can still find her at various locations through uh, throughout um, Disney's Animal Kingdom, as well as in, in parades and things like that. And, and, and I agree that, that having that connection where a, a child can go up and meet and, and talk to her and, and ask questions and things like that, um, I, I think is really important. Um, and, I, and I, you know, again, not being Native American, I haven't seen that film in a long time, but I think it was a, a beautifully drawn. And I, I still to this day love Colors of the Wind. Oh, yeah, the music's incredible. Um, Anna Reen did a fantastic job. She's a great uh, uh, music artist anyways. Um, she did a wonderful job on that. Um, you know, I remember the first time my daughter went and met Pocahontas. Um, you know, we had the conversation before we took her on her first trip and my, my wife's like, so are you going to let her see Pocahontas? So how are you going to handle that? Um, and I said, no, no, I want her to meet her. I want to have her ex that experience for her. I want her to think of Pocahontas as that hero or that role model. Uh, we saw her in Camp Minnie Mickey the first time we went. Um, and it was, you know, my daughter just loved it, ran to her and gave her the big, you know, big hug. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm glad she's still in the parks. It definitely is a story that needs to continue to be told. You know, and before we get to the location where not only are Native Americans referenced throughout the pavilion and the attraction, um, because it's going to lead us to something that's actually happening right now as part of Native American Heritage Month, uh, I, I do want to hit on a couple of other references throughout the parks that that people might not necessarily see or remember so 
we talked about the totem poles in um um so the totem, the totem poles in Wilderness Lodge, those are not the only totem poles that you can find throughout Walt Disney World. Uh, some of my favorites that sometimes are, are, again, hidden in plain sight are in Frontierland in that section all the way in the back by Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. And we'll talk about why those totem poles were originally put there when I start referencing some of the lost attractions and references to Native Americans that we didn't get. But I remember... As a kid, insert you know dream sequence music here. The the Frontier Trading Post, um, which currently is is a pin trading store, uh, originally was a place. So again, okay, according to story and and sort of this this growth of America as we start to make our way west, it was a building that you'd find in a western town where where travelers could stop and get supplies and groceries and and things for their camp and whatnot but at one point they actually sold authentic western gear like they sold cowboy hats and boots and jewelry i still have my toy gun mom if you threw it if you gave it away i'll but they also sold native american items they had headdresses moccasins they had little tom-toms and the, the thing that i know that i have is i have a peace pipe I have a wooden peace pipe with red, and I can see it, Paul, like I had it in my hands yesterday. It had red and yellow and blue plastic feathers on it. And that was one of the things I remember my dad letting me buy before we had left because I had loved Frontierland as a kid. I loved the stories of the Old West, maybe because I had, I'd, we had you know, we had gone on vacation and had traveled there Um you know, now all of those things are, are gone. Certainly you can't buy a toy gun anywhere. And, you know, maybe peace pipes are not what they're going to be selling in Disney <laughs> World anytime soon. But, you know, I, I have a, an old cigar box that still smells like tobacco and has that that burned in emblem of Walt Disney World on the front. And I want to get my peace pipe and put it on my shelf next to that because those are pieces of Walt Disney World history that we'll never see again. You'll never see a cigar box and you'll certainly never see a, a peace pipe again. I, I didn't even know that they, they sold those there. Um, I mean, the, the pipe is definitely something that is uh, very revered for native culture, um, but it's been sold like that for years and years. Again, it's a great thing for kids to see. Um, maybe not the best thing since it is a ceremonial item for, for kids to be playing with. Um, but again, it's, you know, it's, that thing that if the kid comes to Disney world and relates to the native story um, and they can take something home with them uh, to continue that, that's, yeah, that's great. Um, I, again, I don't know if that's the right thing. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, they, know, they the weren't, whole, they weren't selling yeah. peyote in the tobacconist shop. I mean, <laughs> right, right. Let, let's teach kids how to smoke. That probably wasn't a good <laughs> message either, but um, yeah, just to, to be able to take home part of that culture was really cool for, to keep continue that experience for them. And I think when we start talking about not just the store and Main Street and the, and the tobacconist, I think it, it's the next natural connection. We're, we're missing the two elephants in the room at Disney World and Disneyland, which are the, are the cigar store Indians, yes. which, again, Paul, is not meant to be a representation of Native Americans. Native, it's, it's part of uh, American history in terms of having – you know, hundreds of years ago, having cigar store Indians or or visual signs out in front of any store to let people, many of whom were illiterate or possibly immigrants who didn't know how to read, to let them know what was being sold inside. So there'd be a barber pole with the red stripe sort of indicating, you know, actually blood, but there was... Um, you know, scissors for a tailor shop and maybe keys for a locksmith or a, a boot for a shoemaker. And tobacco had a, a cigar store Indian um, because the, the Indians had introduced Europeans to tobacco. And even I think Christopher Columbus, Christ, really, I speak for a living. Christopher <laughs> Columbus wrote about tobacco in his diary when he came to the New World. Yeah. And, you know, I, um, and thinking about this today, I went and I was trying to do some reading on the, the history of cigar store Indians. And you're right. That, that was one of the ways that they pointed that out. And um, so I went and looked at some galleries of some of the old cigar store Indians 
And there was definitely a time period where we went through when they were very stereotypical uh, looking. But you look at some of the very early examples of those Indian carvings. They were very detailed, very authentic, um, amazing the the detail they went into to make sure. You know, I saw some that, um, you know, the typical thing you're going to see is the, the big feather bonnet, um, the Western tribal look. But if you go and look at some of the older ones, you can find them where they have them in the Great Plains style or uh, the Northwestern style of, of Indians. And uh, I even saw some Cherokee and some um, Southeastern style uh, cigar store Indians. Um, so it's it's. You know, there were definitely some problems with those, but um, with some of the ones that were just very stereotypical. But there are some really amazing ones out there uh, and super highly collectible now. Hmm. Uh, people are you know, paying big money for some of these early ones. Um, but, yeah, it is a part of American history. And it's it's, uh, you know, as you're walking along Frontierland and you see that one, uh, I think it's in Frontierland that's sitting out there kind of pointing direction. Um you know, I, it's one of the things that I overlooked for a long period, long time. It was actually a photo pass photographer had to stop there and pose with it one time. And I'm like, wait a minute. I don't know that I noticed this was here. Um, yeah. Yeah. And if you look very carefully and I have to double check the Disneyland one, I know the Walt Disney World Indian again, going back to the D and tell me again. So with, with that, with that giant uh, headdress is what, what tribe or what region would it be from? Usually the Northern Plains. So you're looking at like the Sioux and Blackfoot, Cree, um, those tribes, North Dakota, South Dakota, okay. that area. So if you look carefully, um, he's also wearing a pendant that has the name and face of James Garfield, President. Eight, and it also it says, um, I think it also says U.S. President 1881. So there's one obviously on Main Street, USA, who's been moved because originally the tobacconist shop was on the west side between the House of Magic, oh, rest in peace, and the refreshment corner, which is now Casey's Corner. And they did. They sold cigarettes and cigars and hand-carved pipes and tobacco and things like that. Um, they closed in the early, mid-80s. Uh, you could still buy tobacco products for years, though, over at the, uh, the Main Street Market House. I, I have heard... And I have never heard this anywhere officially. So I have seen him referenced online as Big Chief Seagar, S-E-E-G-A-R. But I do not believe or know or think that that is a, an official name. I have never been I've never heard him reference that other than than fan sites um, or, or photos and stuff online. Uh, I do know that they moved him, but there is the um, the, the one on now the the west side of main street um and then the one in frontierland as well and obviously the two in um in disneyland too and you know talking about uh back when main street had all those individual little shops like the magic shop um pendleton who is a company that has made blankets for native tribes for years and years they actually had a store in disneyland early on hmm. and sold um sold their blankets there um and they still continue to stay. They, they, uh, their blankets are primarily marketed uh, for the native tribes. Uh, they're famous. You know, they have the Chief Joseph blanket that's really popular. And but they actually had a time where they sold directly in the parks. That's interesting. Um, well, we were mentioning the totem poles. My mind went to the other location that you can find totem poles, but more importantly, Paul, they are authentic, hand carved. Uh, Native American, and those are actually over in Canada, um, where uh, artist David Boxley created uh, a, a hand-carved totem pole, which was added to the pavilion back in 1998 to make that pavilion look, and, and more importantly, I think, feel more authentic and pay tribute to Native American cultures, not just here in the United States, but in Canada. And just last year, in January 12th, 2017 two more totem poles were added to the canada pavilion again to bring a little bit more of i think not just the culture but the the story and again um david boxley had created the eagle totem pole and the the whale totem pole that the the whale is a is a, is a feast celebrated by the naganaks nagunaks n-a-g-u-n-a-k-s forgive my bad pronunciation 
And the eagle was a personal favorite tale of Boxley, uh, where a boy finds an eagle caught in a net and then and then frees it, and then the eagle later pays him back for his kindness. And and the story, and Paul, maybe you want to talk just briefly about, you know, w- w- the purpose of totem poles and the stories that they're meant to tell. Right, and and they did. It was one of the ways that the Northwestern tribes would tell their stories, whether it be um, creation legends or um, these kind of stories you're telling now, or even uh, stories of their tribes and their their accomplishments. Um, you know, as you as you go up the totem pole, you can kind of um, you know you would you would read that story and see it in each different level, um, and the ones in in Epcot are amazing. Not only were they created by an actual uh, native artist who is famous for his totem pole work, but when they put them in uh, back in January 2017, they actually brought in dancers from those Northwestern tribes and had them uh, dance and do a ceremony. And, um, you know, it, it was really cool again to see um, not only are they putting a piece of, of authentic culture in, but they're doing it in the right way. And uh, another one of those, you know, if you were there that day in the park, it was another really cool um, little hidden Disney treasure to see uh, some actual dancers come in and 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 dedicate these totem poles. And that's what I like best about it is they they install it overnight, um, and then the next day they have a, a ceremony. Which I think if you were a guest who was there either intentionally or accidentally and got a chance to see that, that would be something really neat to watch. To know that you know real native not. You know, uh, not a, a Disney-fied version, but but real Native American dancers came in to you know dedicate and and celebrate the um, the installation of the totems. And you know, we're talking a lot about stereotypical um, things like the the cigar store Indians, but uh, if you haven't seen any of the outfits that the Northwestern tribes wear, um, they have some beautiful outfits. They have these big uh, blankets they wear that that they put buttons on. Um, and they have, you know, the the Thunderbird design on a lot of their stuff, the whales, things like that. Definitely go look. Uh, we have a we have pictures, Lou, that you took for us um, on our site. But um, just go look those up and, and take a look because they are amazing outfits and totally different than what you, you know, what you're used to seeing, whether it's the Cherokee or the Sioux. Um, Northwestern tribes have a different dress and style that, that's really interesting. And they're spectacular. I mean, I've obviously I've, I've been on your site before and just, you know, curiosity of going through um, the 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 costumes are and, and forgive me if costumes not the right word, but but are works of art. I mean, they are spectacular. And I see why they have these dance ceremonies to display the incredible, you know, beadwork and featherwork that they, they put on them. But I think we, we'll, we'll stay in Epcot um, because I we're, we're trying to get to something that's that's there currently that I think people should go see. And I think some of the best representations of, of Native Americans in the exhibit, but if you head on over to the American Adventure, um, there are references to Native Americans in the lobby, in the show itself, and obviously in the exhibit as well. Um, and I think one of my favorites is if you when you're inside the American Adventure Theater, they have all of these um, statues on both sides of the theater. And one of the statues is the spirit of heritage. And she is a, uh, a, a Native American who I think meant to sort of represent, um, forgive me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Sacagawea, who helped right. guide Lewis and Clark. Um, and she also has her, her um, newborn baby um in there as well but there's also references to native americans in the show itself um as as mark twain's narrating the end of the civil war and the arrival of immigrants to help improve our country um chief joseph interrupts and sort of really you know is upset about the cruel treatment of native americans during the war and and in there is is a famous quote from him which says i will fight no more forever um which um he gave the the timing in terms of the show might not be appropriate because he gave it like in in 1877 or so and then the speech is actually followed by the centennial ex- exhibition which was in 1876 but notwithstanding that um <laughs> it, it is another 
important visual representation of a Native American and an important moment in, in Native American history. Yes, and Chief Joseph is also referenced there. They have quotes on the wall in the American Adventure, and he has another quote that's one of his is, uh, it does not require many words to speak the truth, uh, which, you know, in today's world, that is so, so true. Um, Chief Joseph is definitely one of those uh, really important historical figures, and to um, for them to include him in the telling of the American Adventure, uh, there's lots of things they could have included in that show for the Native reference. Um, that's not one when I first watched the show that I expected, um, but was definitely one that I was like, wow, that's a really, really incredible reference. It's great that they put that in there. I do I can't, my audience will not let me, um, <laughs> <laughs> they'll kill me if I don't go back and say one thing, the whole word costume. Let me back up to that. I, I knew I, I knew I chose uh, the wrong word. I didn't know. I, I didn't know if it was actually called a dress. I, I, I'm forgive my ignorance because that's all it no, is. It's okay, and I, but I do want to say this because um, anytime that people come to powwows.com, they're looking for um, they they want to ask questions. They're looking for more information about native culture, and they'll use that word. Uh, a lot of people get really offended with that word. So their their rationale is when they get offended is that costume is something that you put on at Halloween to dress up and pretend to be something. Whereas our dance clothes are something that we are, something we do. It's not something we are pretending to be. Okay, that aside, um, I, I just, every time it happens on powers.com, we have a flame war all the time over the word costume. Uh, most people say that they prefer the word regalia or clothes or uh, outfit or something like that. But just want to put that out there. Um, I, and listen, as be, tempted as I am to go back and edit out my word, the use of the word costume, no, I, I want to leave it in because it was completely unintentional, and and I apologize for for any you know accidental offense. But it shows, you know, just how so many of us don't know the proper terminology to use, and sometimes things are just meant are, are said in an in an an unintentional you know non deliberate way because we. It, yes, exactly, and that's one of the things that I have. Um, it's one of my little soapboxes I get up on on powwows.com. If, if somebody's coming and wants to learn more about Native culture um, and you use the wrong word, let, let's, you know, again, um, it does not, <laughs> it does not require many words to speak the truth. Um, <laughs> you're looking for the truth and, and, and it's okay to use the incorrect term. Um, you know, once, once you know better, maybe not, but if somebody's coming and they're, they're, legitimately asking a question. Uh, it's just one of those things for my community. I know that they, they will, they will stop right there. Um, so, but anyways, sorry to get off on that aside, but <laughs> no, that it's no, it's a good, uh, just, so I won't make that mistake again, it, it, but it's okay. I, I think we, we as native culture need, to, uh, native people need to, um, not be uh, there. There are plenty of other issues that we can get up in arms about. Uh, the word costume is just not one of them. I, I appreciate the, uh, the, you know, the the correction. Uh, a couple of things too, in the uh, in the lobby, where, or there are many spectacular uh, pieces of artwork and and quotes on the wall. There is a, um, a a painting called Seeds of Hope, which shows Native Americans teaching the the pilgrims in or around Plymouth how to plant plant corn or maize, whatever the appropriate term is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now I'm so like on edge. I want to make sure I say it right. Um, but I, but I love that painting because it shows how the 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 relationship. You know, sometimes we think about um, um, those who came to the new world and Native Americans fighting, but but here they are working together and more importantly, learning from each other. Yeah, the, you know, in the early days. It, um... It, it was tough on both sides. Um, you know, it was, it was a, a shocking thing for, for natives to see this coming, you know, new people coming, but there was a partnership in a lot of areas of the country. They were working together to, to get through and to survive. Um, and there were so many exchanges like that where, uh, you know, native people were giving things to the settlers and, and they incorporated it into their lives. And so many things that, um, you know, were given to, to native tribes that were, um, integral in how the, the tribes went on. So yeah, it's really cool to see that relationship. Um, 
it, Epcot ha- or the American Adventure has a, an amazing thing right now. We'll talk about later, but um, one of the one of my favorite things, and they just took this away. I'm sorry to see it go, but um, John Harrington, who was a Native American astronaut, he actually took his mission patch and had it beaded, uh, and that used to be on exhibit in the American Adventure. And that was one of those things I always like to go in there and show my daughter and say, you know, look at this little piece of you know Native culture. Um, this went with him on the shuttle up in space. Um, just a little piece of beadwork that went with him. That was a that was a really cool touch. I, I don't know where that is now. I'm hoping it went to the Smithsonian or somewhere else. Um, but that was a cool thing to see. Well, and I think that's a good transition point to um, the exhibit, which is currently at the American Adventure Pavilion called Creating Tradition, Innovation, and Change in American Indian Art. Um, I think an overlooked experience certainly an opportunity is that gallery that is in the American adventure um, show building. I think oftentimes people will go in if voices of Liberty is not performing or if they're waiting a long time before the next show, I think it's something that you should make a a deliberate and intentional carving out of time to go and see, talk a little bit about the, the native American exhibit that's in there right now. Yeah, it's, I was so excited to see this come um, and I'm really looking forward to making it down there soon to see this in person. Uh, but it was a partnership that came about um, actually uh, I have a friend that works at the Smithsonian. He, and he was telling me about it. Um, it it's an exhibit that features, you know, some amazing artwork um, from artists all around the country. Um, it's 89 different um, pieces of art uh, from 40 different tribes and, um, and it was something that the Native American American Indian Museum, God, I can't say it right. The Museum of the American Indian Smithsonian um, helped Disney get. Um, and, you know, they've got beadwork and blankets and all kinds of textiles and other things in their artwork. Um, and it's it's an amazing exhibit. I'm hoping it's going to be there for a long time. Um, and like you said, I hope it's not not just something that you uh, is a distraction, but something you'll go in and spend some time and take you know take the time to read the the explanations and to to kind of get the stories behind each piece of artwork. Um, definitely a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about Native culture in a place you would not expect it at all uh, to have something like that. It, it is truly museum quality. Um, uh, an exhibit in there. Um, it was done by, like I said, the, uh, the Smithsonian helped do this. So uh, it's high, you know, very, very amazing, amazingly done. Um, they took a lot of time with this and worked with the artists. Definitely a must see now at Disney for me. And, and look, I, I think it it's uh, appropriate and and timely and important because if the 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 name of the pavilion is the American Adventure. Native American history and culture and tradition and art is a requisite part of that. And a scene here or a reference here and there throughout the parks is not enough to help us understand Native Americans' role in our collective American adventure. And I love, Paul, that a lot of what is in there is not necessarily Native American art that's new, but there are... Uh, blankets from the 1890s and uh, art from the early 1900s. So this is stuff that has a, a real history to it. Um, and I like the fact that it's it's done in in partnerships with not just the artist, but these organizations. My understanding is that the exhibit is going to be here for five years and they are going to include new artifacts. They're going to refresh the displays and incorporate pieces from the 570 plus tribes that are recognized by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So it is going to be a living, breathing, changing exhibit, which gives a a, a repeatability factor, especially for those of us who are locals who can see it once and then go back a few months or a year later and see a completely different exhibit and learn about not just maybe those tribes whose names we've we've heard or familiar with, but some of those which might for us might be more obscure, but I think affords us a, a great opportunity. 
all I heard you say was I have to make a research trip uh, once or twice a year for the next five years. Is that, is that what I got? That's that? exactly if the, I will talk to whoever I get your wife on the phone. I'll I'll tell her because uh, look. And what I like too, Paul, is like like prior exhibits. It's not just meant to be a, a passive walking through experience. There's um, interactive video exhibits. So if you wave your hand in front in front of a display that looks like a, a fire, like a campfire the flames actually turn into a video presentation and there is uh, Native American music, again, performed by Native American musicians. So it's a very sort of supportive environment in terms of not just what you see, but what you you hear as well. And, you know, they've done a good job of incorporating lots of the different tribes, 40 different tribes. Uh, so you're going to see some things, you know, just from what I've seen online and read, you you're going to see things from the um, um, Potawatomi tribe, which is um, up there in the, the Great Lakes area. Their artwork, they have some beautiful things that they do, especially in their ribbon work and their moccasins. Uh, not something you typically see in, in uh, the you know what is normally portrayed in movies and, and on TV. Um, and they have some Alaskan art that, again, you're just not going to see outside of places like this. Um, it's going to be a really unique place to go in get exposure to all these different tribes. Yeah. Maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll have to do like a meet of the month or something over at American adventure outside. And maybe I'll make it a point to, uh, to not just go in and see voices of Liberty, but go in and to check out the exhibit um, as well. I, I just, I don't know what, as we were talking sparked um, something that I had forgot to mention earlier. It's small, but I want to, because I try to be a, a trivia completist, when we were talking about Native American references in the parks, I completely forgot about Big Thunder Mountain because according to story, um, both in Florida with the tiny town of Tumbleweed and in California with the town of Rainbow Ridge, the, the reason why the, um, the flood happened was because of the, the spirits of what the Native Americans called Big Thunder Mountain were angered by the miners taking gold from what would what was and still is a, a sacred location to them. So the mountain would the, the thunder would come from the angry mountain whenever gold was removed. And it was actually based on a a um a storyline and, and superstitions of an actual mountain in Wyoming. I don't know necessarily what specific uh tribe or anything it was, but it's I love the fact that there's not just the Native American reference, but it is based on an actual legend or a story or now. See, now I'm so I'm concerned about what would I call it or or history, whatever um, it, it might be. Yeah, you're doing fine. Yeah. That, <laughs> and there are lots of stories like that throughout the country. Um, it, again, you know, it, it may not be true. It may, you know, who knows, but. Uh, to see Disney incorporate that into the backstory of an attraction, again, it's a nice, it's a nice little way of, of Disney recognizing Native culture. Um, it's not something they had to do. It's not something they, there's who knows how many stories they could come up with to have a, a mountain there. Um, uh, so I just enjoy and appreciate that they wo- wove that into the storytelling. And I think this actually, this is a happy accident. Like Bob Ross, it's a happy little tree. It's a happy little accident because where this attraction sits, and I've talked in the past about the history of Frontierland and Big Thunder Mountain, and if you go back and listen to my audio tour of Frontierland, I really get into the what almost was, the, the Walt Disney World that almost was, because the area that encompasses Splash Mountain and Big Thunder Mountain was originally supposed to be home to a huge, not mountain, but mountainous backdrop area known as Thunder Mesa. This was really going to be sort of part of a phase two of Walt Disney World and be that that visual weenie, that centerpiece of Frontierland. And this was a Mark Davis um, uh, design and idea. And again, I talk more about, you know, how Davis was upset when it eventually went away. But in this Mesa and hiking trails and, you know, waterfalls and deserts, was going to be a Pueblo Indian village. And there was actually talk about having an, a pack mule sort of, um, you know, walking its way down the, um, the the different bluffs. But the 
idea of having this Indian village and Native Americans were going to do a rain dance and they were going to make it rain. And Buddy Baker, um, I, I believe, was actually working with Native Americans to sort of um, come up with a, a theme song, but one that, again, would have been uh, uh, appropriate for that land um, and, and what, you know, the Western River Expedition and all that would have been. So we had almost gotten um, a, a much more of a Native American presence there um you actually brought up something right before we went live which is something i didn't realize um that that took place over at disney's fort wilderness resort which i I love especially during the holidays but in this thanksgiving season right we are in november it is native american heritage month native american heritage month they used to do something to celebrate the season that was beyond just, you know, football and turkey. And there were Thanksgiving teepees at Fort Wilderness. Right. And from what I understand, and maybe somebody out there can tell us uh, more about it, if it's still going on, that it was a group of people. um, I think they called it the Lodge Owners Encampment. And people would come and instead of setting up their RV or their tent, would set up their teepees. And there are folks that do this at powwows and, and other places around the country um, Crow Fair, one of the one of the big powwows of the year, they have hundreds of teepees set up, and people will go and spend a week up there. Um, but apparently, they had this encampment at, at Port Wilderness every year um, at Thanksgiving, and I've seen videos of, of where they would set up and they'd cook outside and and have the meals uh, cooked over the fire. So I'm hoping that still goes on. I'd love to go down there and see that. Uh, maybe somebody can let us know. I I have never heard of that before. I am going to look into that maybe i need a trip to trails and i mean to to fort wilderness and rent i love renting a golf cart there and driving around to find out um i'm going to also make a couple of calls and inquiries to see if the thanksgiving teepees um actually happen but i think um there's sort of two things i want to mention just to sort of of wrap this all up and and when i was talking about the walt disney world that uh, that almost was and the additional visible president presence of Native Americans in the park. We almost got that in a much greater sense and capacity. And this is a show that I have been thinking about doing for a long time. I think now maybe is, a, is the right time to revisit it. But I'm sure you may or may not have heard of a little place called Disney's America. We've talked about how Walt Disney was very much a patriot. He he loved America. He always had this idea for Disneyland of creating a, a section of the park, which would be not just a celebration of all nations, but mostly America, but a place to educate, um, especially young visitors to the roots and 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 uh the timeline that that brought us to the current United States. And back in the late 50s, um, up to about 59 or so, Walt was going to create an area off Main Street, USA, called Liberty Street, which would have been a cul-de-sac that would have recreated sort of think Liberty Square, but but colonial America, um, but almost more of an interactive theater almost because they would have had, you know, blacksmiths and printers showing off what life was life what life was life um in colonial america um that would have ended in a place called liberty square which would have been you know independent hall and things like that that um uh never ended up coming to pass um uh, eventually we here in Walt Disney World get liberty square but in the late 80s, early 90s, um, Michael Eisner had fallen in love with this idea to create a, a much grander extension of that concept, much like Disney's Hollywood Studios took the movie pavilion idea from Epcot and made it into its own park. He was going to create something called Disney's America, um, and and he wrote about in, in a book about how passionate he was for it. He was very, very intimately involved in the, you know, reviewing and approving 
plans and site selections. Um, there's lots of reasons why Disney's America never came to pass. It's another discussion for another day. But the reason why I mention it here is because in, D- in Disney's America, there was going to be Native America land, which may or may not have been the final name, but it was v- very much going to celebrate the history and the culture and the people of Native Americans before Europeans arrived. So 1600 to 1800, somewhere around there, it would have recreated that similar type of, you know, Powhatan Native American village, again, because of of Pocahontas and the area where it was going to be built or that that mid-Atlantic and I'm sure other tribes as well. But there was going to be exhibits and museums and and arts and crafts and and interactive elements as well as a lewis and clark expedition uh attraction i've heard everything from um something like uh, cali river rapids or some sort of a, a flume type uh, attraction it's sad for many reasons that disney's america never came to pass i think in, in context of our conversation paul it's even more of a loss that we never got a full land that's whether it's like Main Street USA or Liberty Square or Frontierland, a place that we can step foot in and go back in time and really understand and sort of live what that experience would have been like. I'm just sitting here thinking about what what could have been. Uh, that, uh, yeah, that could have had so many possibilities. Um, and and we you know we really need a place like that now to. Uh, to bring us all back together and to celebrate what this country is about and, you know, look at our history and know where we're going to, uh, who knows again, maybe, maybe we'll come back to it. Maybe we'll come back to it. And, and, and I don't want to get too far ahead, but you know, one of the things that, and I've asked you many ignorant questions about um, native American culture and history. And look, your site is called powwows. One of the things you do is help people find and uh, encourage them to attend powwows that take place all the time. Like I never really realized how many different tribes there were, how often powwows take place. They're all the time throughout the country. And and a question that I asked was, well, you know, am I allowed to go if I want to learn more, if I want to take my kids, if I want to see what this is like, if I want them to have their pahaska like experience, can I take them to a powwow? Like, are we allowed to attend a powwow as if it was, you know, a, a, an event open to the public. Yes, they are all open to the public. Uh, if they're listed on powwows.com, they are open and welcoming of the public. Uh, I highly encourage it. You know, there is on powwows.com, we list about 1200 powwows each year um, across North America or across the United States and Canada. Um, and we, we know we're missing some. So somewhere in the country, every weekend, there's a powwow going on um, actually working on right now doing a, um, map showing all the dots and kind of um, that pretty much anywhere in the country within an hour drive, you can find a powwow. Um, So yes, highly encourage everybody should go see one. Um, It's an incredible cultural experience. Um, There's food, Lou. Um, (laughs) You had me. Yeah. When you start to describe some of the food offerings, I'm like, I think I need a road trip. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's the singing, the dancing, the crafts and the food. Um, It is a, uh, it's a complete cultural festival, one like you just won't experience anywhere. So, yes, please go take a look at our calendar, find one near you and go check it out. And there's, a, you know, obviously I live, you know, right by Disney World. There, there's a number of tribes here in Central Florida, too. I mean, so even if you come out to Disney World and this is something that that, you know, maybe you want to see. What a tri- so, like, what would around here, what are some of the different tribes and areas that? Yeah, the uh, Seminoles um, have a big powwow in Hollywood, uh, Hollywood, Florida. I'm not sure how far that is um, from Orlando, but, uh, it's in February and that's a really big powwow. Um, I've been a couple of times, um, uh, hundreds of dancers come to that one. Definitely encourage you to go there. Um, there are a couple in Orlando, um, and, uh, some in Northern Florida too. So yeah, there's tons of, of powwows right there in Florida that you can definitely find some close by. And I'm going to shamelessly plug for you because one of the things I love that you do on powwows.com is, it, it, it invite us to learn more, but also witness what one is like. You live broadcast countless powwows throughout the years, so we could just go on your site and watch and get a sense of 
the beauty and the pageantry and the history and the culture. And I think for a lot of people, that's a good stepping stone to get an idea of what exactly it looks like, what it feels like and having, and especially with your, uh, you know, letting us know that it is open and, and welcoming to everybody, what that experience would be like for those of us who are not native American. Yeah, definitely. Go take a look at our live streams. Um, it, it kind of gets you acquainted to what, what you're going to see before you get there. Um, and, and, you know, again, if you can't make it out, it's, it's the best thing to be in there. You know, you can sit on your couch all weekend and watch it. Um, we have people that will watch it for hours and, and, um, and talk to us throughout the weekend. So yeah, that's a great way to do it. And here's my shameless plug Lou while I, <laughs> while I have a chance right now for native American heritage month, we are um, challenging our readers, whether you're native, you're, or you're just somebody interested in the culture, um, whether you have, uh, you know, less native in you than Elizabeth Warren or, you know, or your full blood, we welcome everybody to come right now. We're doing a, a challenge called explore native and we're, each week we're taking a different part of the culture and talking about it and presenting some uh, things for everybody to learn about, to share with others um, and some things we asking you to do. Um, and there's a contest involved so you can win some prizes, but yeah, it's a uh, www.powels.com slash explore native. Uh, we're really encouraging people to get involved in the culture and learn more about it throughout native American heritage. Month. And we were talking beforehand as I was researching this topic, something came to me and, and, and I'm, you know, I'm I'm making obviously light of it, but I was trying to sort of see about other, um, you know, Native American connections to Disney. And and I didn't realize that there was actually a a very local Native American connection that that's very recently because there's uh, in this area, obviously there's a lot of development going on on in the Orlando and and Disney and and other theme park areas down the street. And a... um, (laughs) Uh, it, there's a development area in an area called Bay Hill where they were looking to create all these mil- multi-million dollar homes and they had to stop construction because there's possible Indian burial grounds there. And I'm like, oh my God, it's poltergeist. They just moved the headstones. Like, so um, I, I thought it was interesting that that there were, as we're talking about local connections to Native Americans, um, this is an area that um, at one point um, looks like it did have uh, uh a Native American presence, not just in the Disney parks, but in a real presence in the area long before Disney ever got here. And with the amount of construction that goes on around there, I'm surprised we haven't heard more about those kind of things. Yeah, Cause there are, there were definitely, you know, natives all over the state of Florida. So it's surprising we haven't found more of that um, with all the stuff we've dug up down there. And speaking of all the stuff that we've dug up, Paul, I, I think, I hope that we have found, all of or most of the Native American references in the Disney parks. Did we miss anything? Let me know. You can go to Facebook, uh, go to uh, www.radio.com slash community. That'll take you to our Facebook group. I would love to discuss this topic more with you there. If you have any questions, you can post them there. I know Paul will uh, will definitely pay attention. So if you have any questions, you can post them there. If you are Native American or if you want to learn more, again, go to powwows. If you want to find a a powwow in your uh, area, go to powwows.com. If you want to find me and Paul, we'll be at the exhibit in Epcot and then probably eating our way through uh, Walt Disney World at some point. Uh, Thank you so much, man, for all the information and the insight and uh and hopefully people will will take a little bit more time pay attention to some of those wonderful details and stories and important history that's hiding in plain sight yeah thanks luke for having us um i really appreciate you being uh, you know inviting me on and to talk about this like you said i didn't know there were all these references so it was really cool to kind of think about these um I'm working on more research trips now because of you. Um, and I've got to make a research trip, but there's um, there's even a native show over in Disneyland Paris. So I'm trying to talk the wife into that one. We'll see. I can help you with um, that. I can, yeah, I can definitely help you. Got to get over there, right? Uh, but yeah, thanks, Lou. And I, for all the listeners, I hope they will uh, take a little time and go see some of the native culture, whether it's at Disneyland or at a powwow near you. Time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week, where I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World's history, or I want to see how well you pay attention to the details, sometimes in what you see or hear, maybe even eat, 
And if you think you know the answer, you can enter via our online form for a chance to win a Disney prize package. Before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, I took you over to Epcot Center, specifically to Club Cool, where you can sample some refreshing and free Coke flavors from around the world. I'm sure you've either tried or been subject to the Beverly trick, but I wanted to know if you had a favorite and maybe one you've even tried to order before and have at home. But the question that I asked you was to tell me, what's the name of the Club Cool beverage that you can sample that hails from Japan? And I first want to thank and congratulate all of you who entered and got this one correct and knew that the answer is Vegeta Beta. And this is a drink that launched in Japan back in 1992. And unlike most of the other drinks that come out of the sample fountain, it's actually a non-carbonated beverage that's made with passion fruit and apricot flavors. It's rich in beta carotene, which is why it has this very interesting orange looking color. It's very popular in Japan, due in part to the health benefits. It's something you can get from a vending machine on a street corner. Anyway, I took all of the correct entries, randomly selected one, and last week you were playing for my 102 Ways to Save Money for and at Walt Disney World book. All seven of my virtual audio walking tours of Magic Kingdom, both of which are still on sale for $10 on the WW Radio store, a vinyl sticker for your car or laptop, a pop socket for your phone, and I'm also, instead of a mystery prize, I am going to throw in a WW Radio t-shirt. And last week's winner, randomly selected, is Ray Gaffney. So Ray, use the online form. I have your address. I've got your shirt size. I will get your prize package out to you right away. But if you played last week and didn't win, that's okay, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So it is Mickey Mouse's birthday this week, celebrating the big 90. You look better than ever, Mickey. So in order to celebrate, I thought we would have a question about Mickey, but specifically in Walt Disney World. And I'm sure you know that Storybook Circus in Magic Kingdom was at one time Mickey's Toontown Fair. That audio tour still available, by the way. But that area originated as something else and had another name before it became Mickey's Toontown Fair. So what I want to know from you this week is, what were the original two names for that land? Before it became Storybook Circus, it was Mickey's Toontown Fair, but there were two names for that land beforehand. That's what I want to know this week. You have until Mickey Mouse's birthday, Sunday, November 18th, also my daughter's birthday, at 11.59 p.m. It's like we planned it that way. To go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast, use the online form there. Again, you're going to play for all the digital products, a vinyl sticker, a pop socket, a shirt. And you know what? I'm going to throw in a special Mickey Mouse birthday celebration surprise package gift. So good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in this and every week, whether you are a new listener or have listened for all 537 plus shows. I sincerely appreciate you and your time and your friendship. I would love for you to go to www.radio.com slash community. That is the WW Radio Box People group on Facebook. That's where I want the conversation, more importantly, the community to take place. Come by, introduce yourself, grab a snack, make yourself at home talk about this week's show, any of the past shows, or anything in the Disney world that you would like to chat about. And speaking of thanks and community and gratitude, I want to say a huge thank you to everybody who is part of the WW Radio Nation family, including some new and longtime members like Lisa Milam, Mary Dale Bannister, Dan Boyle, David A. Johns, Brian Strong, Jill Sherrod, Morgan Thomas, Laura Sleeper, and A.J. Minotti. I sincerely appreciate your love and your support and your friendship. And if you want to find out not only how you can be part of the WW Radio Nation, which will help support the show, but you'll also get exclusive rewards every month, including scavenger hunts from the parks. We have a private Facebook group, magic band covers, there's logo gear, backpacks, t-shirts, monthly care packages from Walt Disney World. We also do exclusive live video group calls and lots more. You can visit www.radio.com slash support. Also, don't forget that a portion of your contribution does go to our Dream Team project to benefit the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. 
And again, keeping in mind that this show is not just for you, but something that I want to do by and with you, I'd love to hear from you. So if you have a question that you want me to answer on the show, you can email me, lou at www.radio.com. If you have a comment or just want to say hello from the parks, call the voicemail at 407-900-9391. Again, join the WW Radio Box People group. Like our page on Facebook. I am at Lou Mangello on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. I'd love to keep the conversations going online wherever and whenever you are most comfortable. And of course, as much as I love having those online discussions, nothing beats a handshake and a hug. It is why I continue to do monthly meetups in Walt Disney World now for more than 10 years. Uh, November is quickly getting away from us and the holidays are coming up and Destination D is coming up this weekend as well. Uh, I am trying to figure out a time that will accommodate the most people and the very hectic November schedule. So please stay tuned to the Box People group as well as Twitter. Uh, I will probably announce in the next day or so, maybe the Friday night of Destination D, if we can fit it into the schedule there. December's, let's sort of plan out a little bit farther, December's is most likely going to be on Saturday, December 8th. Stay tuned for exact time and locations. Again, we'll have announcements and events on the Box People group. And January's, as always, will be Marathon Weekend. That'll be Saturday, January 12th in Magic Kingdom. Again, if you go to www.radio.com slash community, you can find out about these upcoming events as well as special group activities. We are going to Japan next year on a very special Adventures by Disney in October. We now have only two spots left for this WW Radio group trip, 11 nights in Japan. Go to www.radio.com slash Japan19. We also have our cruise out of New Orleans in February 2019. I'll also have additional announcements about special events coming up as well. Speaking of events, I also do uh, meetups on the road as I travel to speak. And if you want to find out more about how I could maybe help you, your business, your conference, your event, or your your or your kid's school, visit lumangelo.com. And there you can also find out how I can help you individually turn whatever that thing that you are passionate about into your profession and help you sort of turn what you love into what you do. I do one-on-one mentoring and small group coaching. I also have not one, but two, here's the announcement, two events coming up next year. Next year will be my fourth year of doing my Momentum Weekend Workshop in Walt Disney World. The dates are going to be Saturday and Sunday, September 28th and 29th here in Walt Disney World. Tickets are on sale now. Right now, There, I have a super early bird special going on where you can literally save hundreds off the tickets to Momentum as well as the Monday Mastermind Day. And in the past, I have done a weekend retreat leading up to Momentum. This year, I'm going to do one a little bit earlier. We're going to do a spring retreat February 1st through the 3rd, 2019. This is going to be a weekend-long, very small mastermind event where I only have 10 like-minded entrepreneurs who want to turn what they love into what they do, get together for a three-day retreat in a huge, beautiful luxury vacation home in Orlando. This is going to be from Friday, February 1st until Sunday, February 3rd. And I want to take care of everything for you so you can only focus on you and the event. So I take care of your room, your meals, all the materials, If you go to lumangelo.com slash retreat or just go to lumangelo.com, click on the retreat tab, you can find out more. Currently, there are only six spots remaining out of the 10 for the retreat. So if you are interested, you can take advantage of the early bird pricing now. And again, there are only just a few spots available. All this is at lumangelo.com. I want to quickly say huge thanks to Becky Mankin and the entire team over at mousefantravel.com. They are my official my recommended travel provider because I've personally used them and continue to have to use and recommend them for more than a decade, whether you're coming to World, Land, Adventures by Disney, Alani, a Disney cruise, or anywhere else on the planet. They give you the best possible prices at no cost to you, and more importantly, an exceptional level of personal service. Go to celebrationspress.com, find out how you can subscribe and order back issues of Celebrations Magazine. And as always, my friend, and you are my friend. You continue to demonstrate that so often and I am so grateful to you and for you but all I ask is that if you like the show and I hope that you do please let others know about it help spread the word tweet out that you're listening to this week's show share it on Facebook on your page your profile or in your favorite Disney related group and if you can take 30 seconds that all it takes 
to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. It's incredibly helpful. I want to thank some recent reviewers like Lagoska, Lago, Lagos, L-A-G-O-C-Z-A, who says, this is the best way to experience Disney magic between trips. It's the best Disney podcast I've found, hands down. I love the interesting content, amazing guests, and simply the fact that I feel closer to my favorite place despite being so far away. I've been binge listening to the podcast and driving my family crazy. Oh, sorry. With all the new facts I've learned, the only way I've found to tide me over until my next trip, newer listener, but already a super fan. Thanks, Lou. Lagoska, you're not a fan. You're a friend. You know that, brother, but I appreciate it. Uh, Lisa1980 says, great show. I love the reviews, the lists, and the nostalgia. It takes me back to my great family trips every time I listen. Amy Page 1122333 says, it's a weekly dose of Disney magic. Lou's podcast is hands down the best podcast out there. His knowledge, humor, passion, and fun personality are assets in every episode. Thank you. Lots of great information, interesting interviews, and exciting perspectives on what's new, what's upcoming, long lost, etc. from our favorite place. He truly transports you to Disney through the show, and he's also created, we've also created, an amazing community of Disney fans who are just as fun and friendly as he is. That's because you guys are magnets for the people you want to attract. And he's not kidding about the handshake and the hug. I'm not. Lou's just as friendly and personable in real life as he is on the air. What a great show and even better person. Amy, Lisa, and Lagoska. Well, I'm sorry, I'm butchering your name. Uh, thank you all so very much again. Just go to iTunes, search for WW Radio, or go to www.radio.com slash iTunes. I give you instructions and a link on exactly how and where to do it. And finally... Most importantly, thank you, thank you. It's it's a it's a line from a song, but I mean it. Thank you for being my friend. If there's some way that I can repay the gift that you give me of your time and your love and your support and your attention, please let me know. And I hope that every single day you do something that is helping you get closer to wherever it is that you want to be tomorrow. And again, if I can help you, let me know. But take little steps every day and just make sure that whatever it is that you're doing doesn't just keep you busy, but make sure it's something that it's productive and important and valuable. So figure out what those goals are and take time every day. Don't waste time every day taking those small steps. Think about the why, why what you're doing today and how it's going to get you to where you want to be. And what's that one thing that'll maybe help you get from where you are to where you want to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love and appreciate you. And I hope that this is your best week ever so until next time see ya hey lou this is ryan calling from portland oregon they started listening to your podcast a couple of years ago and was super inspired by uh the one you did about the fort wilderness campground and decided to head down there and actually camp with my boy scout son there for his 12th birthday well, that was about a year ago, and we had such an incredible experience that somehow we managed to convince his mom and sister and younger brother that maybe we should go and actually do it again. So for a countdown, we'll be there in about eight days during a fast family vacation again here with the entire family this time, and can't wait. But the story doesn't end there, and this is probably the major reason I called. was well, just a thank you. You see, about a week and a half ago, I'm sorry, a month and a half ago, we um, we got a phone call from the organization that we work for that's actually based down there in Florida, and, well, it just so happens there's a lot of transition going on, and they wanted us to come down there for a season, actually move our family for maybe six, seven months. And that was a bit of a change for us going from the northwest to the southeast, and we were really thinking about that. And then I happen to flip to your podcast, catching up on a few back episodes, and what do I see but moving to Disney? Well, that's pretty fascinating. Sat there and listened to both episodes. Brought a lot of peace and just comfort to my heart, knowing that there's a community down there and that it's a good place to live. So, guess we're moving down there. We'll be living about an hour away from you, but hey, maybe we'll actually make it out to a meet of the month. I'll actually get to shake your hand and give you a hug sometime. So. Once again, thanks for all you do. You're helping out a lot of us, giving a lot of peace of heart, and we're so grateful uh, to just be a part of this community. Can't wait to meet you. Take care. Hi, Lou. This is Derek from Albuquerque. I really enjoyed your most recent episode, number 535, the top 10 things you like about Main Street USA. 
My favorite thing about MSU is actually an experience. It's running down Main Street during any of the run Disney races at Walt Disney World. It's such an emotional moment to turn the corner, see the castle all lit up, and hear all the spectators and cast members cheering. Running down Main Street towards the castle and high-fiving the kids and adults is such a huge adrenaline rush. Oh, and a tip for first-time Disney runners. Take your time and soak it all in. It's so easy to get amped up and begin running too fast, but there's lots of race left, especially in the marathon. Thank you, Lou, for all the entertaining podcasts that have gotten me through the past few years of training. I especially enjoy the Tim Foster episodes like this one. The rapport the two of you have is great, and some of the comments he makes just make me burst out laughing, which does get me some funny looks from the folks in the gym sometimes. Looking forward to many more. Hello, Lou Mandello. It's Gabby Naldo from Columbia, Maryland. I am calling you from the Magic Kingdom, actually from the um, Jungle Skipper Canteen, to be exact. We are waiting for our dinner reservation. Um, I just wanted to say hey, and thanks again for the awesome sweaty hug towards the end of the race. It's exactly what we needed to get us through the end. Um, it's been a great weekend here at Disney World. Um, we had a blast during the race, but I think we had more fun at the Food and Wine Festival, whining and dining around the past two days. Um, but yeah, sad to go home, but hopefully we'll be back soon. Much love to you and all of the WW Radio running team and everyone for the cheer squad. We appreciate it so much. I'll talk to you later. Have a great rest of your week. Bye. Hey, Lou. It's Christine Martin from Flower Town, PA. It is Wednesday night, um, probably about an hour and a half before uh, you get in the box. And I just was finished listening to the most recent podcast of your Adventures by Disney to California. And I so want to go on an Adventures by Disney. I wanted to go to Japan so bad, but um, just can't. I don't have that kind of money. But um, I so enjoy listening to them. I just live vicariously through you guys. You are so good at describing everything, that it makes me feel like I'm there. But this past weekend, I took my dad uh, downtown Philadelphia to Franklin Square area, and I thought of Disney, and I thought of all of you guys in the box because I went to this place called Shane's Confectionery, and then I went to Franklin Ice Cream Fountain, and everything was so awesome. I felt like I went back in time, and the character and, and the detail of everything I felt like I was like at the turn of the century and it made me think of Disney World and somebody actually said to me in the box and I can't remember who he was that those stores look like they should be on Main Street and they did. They look like they should be on Main Street USA in Magic Kingdom and I could have spent all night in there just looking at everything um, but it made me think of you guys uh, in the box and, and I wish some of my Disney friends had been there. But it was awesome. So I do recommend Franklin Square. Anybody coming to Philly, go check it out. It's such an awesome area. So so much character, some really awesome restaurants. I saw a great sushi place. I'm going to try it. Have a good week, everybody. I'll see you in the box tonight. Make somebody smile. Bye-bye. Hello, Lou Mangiello. It's Darlene Nagy from West Seneca, New York. It's a little snowy up here this weekend. But I am looking forward to my 78 days till my trip to Walt Disney World. And you have 336 days until the adventure by Disney to Japan. Woohoo! Then, coming up really quick, is going to be February. You have a retreat weekend that you planned. And then D23 Expo in August. September, the next momentum date to be announced, and then the cruise to the Bahamas from New Orleans, February of 2020. Wow. Look at what's coming up. And we have Thanksgiving right around the corner. And my daughter, Alicia, is turning 30 this week. So everybody, wish her a happy birthday. Thank you. Have a magical day. Happy birthday, baby. Happy birthday, baby.